Let's welcome Jeff Moyer, Chief Executive Officer, Rodale Institute, Cutsdown, Pennsylvania. Hello, and thank you for allowing me to share a few minutes of time with you as we open the Beyond Pesticides Conference on Cultivating Communities of Health. You know, we all come to conferences like this with certain expectations, certain goals, and certain interests. My goal today is to inspire you to explore a new world, explore a new food system, and explore a new paradigm where farmers actually focus on soil health, not just yield. And not just yield at any cost, but where people have access to healthy, organic food that comes from regenerated systems. We may not all agree on many things, but we can all agree that identifying problems with our current food system is relatively easy. The effects of pollution on our health can be seen everywhere. The effects on production systems that we use to produce food in conventional systems can be seen in degraded soils to the point where our planet is actually in jeopardy. And you know, it affects the choices that we make in our eating habits. And those eating habits dictate poor health outcomes. Uh, so my goal here today is to kind of make you aware that easy, it, it's easy to point out problems with the system. What's really hard is to point out solutions. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. We as humans are really at a crossroads in time. We all need to make a collective decision on the way we're gonna go. We don't have a problem necessarily with nature. What we have is a problem with human nature. You know, all of us, unfortunately, want things really fast. We want things really easy. And we want things really cheap. Well, you know, <laughs> that comes with its own set of problems. Um, if you look at what we mean when we say fast, cheap, and easy, what we're saying is, and what we're telling farmers is, we're willing to accept pollution, contamination, and externalized costs. There's no way of avoiding those outcomes because we set the stage for failure if our measurement for success is anything but easy, fast, and cheap. And you're gonna hear me say that throughout the conversation today, because what we're trying to do as we look at the world is move away from easy, fast, and cheap. It's time for us to hit the reset button. We need to create a new set of metrics for success in our food system. A food system where nature will help us reset it for us. So we need a new button. And that button is a button that says we're willing to reset ourselves so that we can regenerate our soils, regenerate our own personal health, and yes, even regenerate the planet in which we live on. Metrics can be measured in the success of healthy outcomes. It's, it's not an issue that's created by agricultural chemistry and, and you know, pharmaceuticals. So what happens is we, we pollute our soils, we pollute our planet, and then we end up eating this food and the chemical companies that sell farm chemicals also sell the pharmaceuticals that then try to make us healthy. But we have solutions, and the solutions are really at our fingertips. And they're actually backed up by science. They're not just ideas, they're not just hopes, they're not just wishes, but Rodale Institute is a shining example of what can be achieved when bright, inquisitive people decide to work on solutions that improve our planet and improve our health. And at the same time, we produce bountiful harvests of healthy food for healthy people. But the story doesn't stop there. It really only begins there. By regenerating our soils, we can regenerate our spirit and the spirit of farmers and the spirit of communities, and we can actually cultivate healthy communities around us by changing the way we focus our agricultural system. Now, there is nothing right about this beautiful farm. We know this isn't going to be easy, but I've got news for you. It is this type of farming is fast, it's easy, and it's cheap. And it looks beautiful, but it isn't natural. 
And in the end, the products it produces are devoid of the nutrients we need to grow and thrive. So if I were to show this picture to a group of farmers, they say, that's beautiful. What a lovely field, but it's part of the problem. Because farms should really look like this. Farms should look a little messy. Nature is messy. Biology is messy. The road to human health can be messy. But this farm also delivers biodiversity. It's bountiful. It's bountiful with nutritious food, healthy food, and it helps us regenerate and, the wild, and, and moderate the wild swings in weather and climate. So farms need to look like this to be part of the solution. You know, I just read an article earlier this week in NPR that said chemicals used to kill weeds and facilitate conventional no-till production is the way to conserve farms and soil. That is so sad. This is a conventional no-till field with herbicides. Is it sustainable? Absolutely not. This is part of the problem. This is modern agriculture. This isn't healthy soil. I say this is wrong. This is the wrong path and it's the wrong way for us to go. This is a chemical induced desert devoid of soil life producing food nobody wants while contaminating our air, our water and our body. And at the same time, we're setting the stage for the pharmaceutical companies to step in and keep us functioning. And it's not that organic, I mean, it's not that no-till is the problem because here's a field that's an organic no-till field. It is regenerative. It is part of the solution. It still allows farmers to wear the same color hat, drive the same color tractor, pull machinery through the field, plant the same crops, but we're doing it in a way that reduces erosion, enhances the soil microbiome, all while producing foods that are rich in nutrients and micronutrients that our bodies need to be healthy, to form healthy communities. And we can farm like this at a scale worldwide taking advantage of modern agricultural engineering, taking advantage of robotics, taking advantage of satellite guided systems, taking advantage of seed genetics, specifically designed for this system. We are not stepping backwards, we're stepping forward. By enhancing human nature, we can refocus our energy and our resources in a way that empowers all of us, including farmers, to engage in activities that will transform our lives and our world in ways we can only imagine if we focus on the health of our soils. I'm gonna show you a little video here that talks about the health of our soils. I am the soil. Throughout the world, I've been degraded, used for food and fiber, but not cared for. I've been treated like dirt. Today, I'm only half of what I was 100 years ago. But there is hope. Amidst the rolling hills of Pennsylvania, a group of farmers and scientists recognize that I'm alive, that I am a miracle teeming with billions of microorganisms, bacteria, and fungi that form the basis of life on our planet. There at Rodale Institute, they're teaching farmers across the world to heal me, to bring me back to life, to harness the power of nature because humans cannot survive without soil. In their labs, they're developing new solutions, solutions that don't rely on the toxic chemicals that make me sick. In their fields, they're discovering my power to combat climate change in their trials. They're harnessing my ability to produce healthy food. And they are spreading the word to beginning farmers, to policymakers, to scientists, and to consumers like you. Will you join them? I am the soil. Today I am broken. But with your help, I can be renewed, restored, regenerated. I can be healed, and life on Earth can flourish.
So you can see that we can have healthy soil, healthy food, and healthy people, as G.I. Rodell said way back in 1942. We have to have action. We have to have action that's led by science. And we know that we can have powerful science that directs the action of all of us around the planet. At Rodale Institute, we have some projects that have been in place for over 40 years, and our research really is a catalyst for change as we look at the way we can help farmers adopt and mitigate climate change. We can improve the health and nutrition of people, and we can give farmers the support that they need to work to feed us. You know, our farming systems trial that's been in place for over 40 years actually shows us that we can have equal yields, competitive yields with conventional agriculture. But while we're doing it, we use 45% less energy and we release 40% fewer carbon emissions into the atmosphere. Agriculture can be part of the solution to climate change. If we look at our vegetable systems trial, we can show that we can actually improve the nutrition of our food based on how we farm the soil. This experiment actually degrades soil using conventional practices and maps that degradation against the health of food in both root crops, fruit crops, and leafy greens. And I challenge you all to take a look at that research. The most exciting piece of research that's coming out of that project has to do with an amino acid, a nutraceutical amino acid called ergothionine. Again, look it up online. Find what's happening in ergothionine. This is a this is a busy image, I know, but what it really shows you is that as ergothionine levels drop in our food, things like autism, attention deficit disorder, and Alzheimer's go up. Organic soils have more ergothionine because it's only produced by soil funguses. The power of the soil to heal us is tremendous. We need to train new farmers to step up and take advantage of these new technologies and be part of what we're doing. We have an exciting project where we have a farm to patient plate system working with a hospital nearby. Yes, medical professionals are coming, kicking and screaming into the world of agriculture, but we have to invite them in because they are part of the solution to our human health. So farmers and medical practitioners have to share the same place in the same space. But so do all of us. To heal ourselves, it takes everybody on the planet. It takes you, it takes me, working together to incorporate solutions into our daily lives that make sense for all of us. So I invite you, I invite you now to join Rodale Institute, join with each other. I know it's a virtual conference, but reach out hand in hand so that we can do this together. Uh, it takes all of us to solve the problem. Don't be a problem identifier be a problem solution. Together, we can do that. So right now, I want to thank you for the time we've had to spend together. I want to turn you loose on this conference, poised to share your energy and commitment to the learning and action steps we'll discover together, poised to regenerate and cultivate communities of health. Thank you very much. It's been an honor and privilege to be with you today, and I look forward to our Q&A session later on. Thank you. Let's welcome Tyrone Hayes, Professor of Integrative Biology, University of California, Berkeley, Berkeley, California. I want to start today by first thanking the organizers for inviting me. It's my honor to be here and thank you for your support and all of you for being here. Today I'm going to tell you a story from Silent Spring to Silent Night. Before I embark, before we take on and start that story, I'd like to start by acknowledging the funding sources that have assisted me of my research over these last 30 years. I also want to use this opportunity to um, disclose that I have been funded by Novartis and Sugenta Crop Protection and affiliated company EcoRisk. Uh, so that's my disclosure. And I also want to give a special acknowledgement to Beyond Pesticide and Series, who funded my most recent work in the area that I'll talk to you about today. I like to think of myself as just a little boy who likes frogs. I grew up here in, in Congaree Swamp, in the swamps in South Carolina. I, mean, I had a regular house and everything like everybody else, but I spent as much of my time as possible in places that look like this growing up. And one of the things that fascinated me about places like swamps and Congaree Swamp was 
was amphibians and the ability of amphibians to adapt to multiple habitats and multiple changes to go from living in water as tadpoles to living on land as frogs. And then later in my life, I became fascinated with the hormones that allow these animals to live in these varying environments and to adapt to these often rapidly changing habitats. One of the things I learned as an adult, although I'm still just a little boy who likes frogs, is that there are chemicals, there are th changes that we make in the environment that amphibians aren't quite so adept at, at changing and adapting to. And one of those changes that we make to the environment are so-called endocrine disrupting chemical contaminants that are placed into the environment. About 20 years ago, after I became a professor at uh, University of California, Berkeley, I was asked by then Novartis, who later became Syngenta, to examine their compound atrazine and determine whether or not atrazine might be an endocrine disruptor. Now, if you haven't heard of atrazine, it's a so-called s chlorotriazine It's an herbicide or weed killer that's mostly used on corn in the United States. It's been used since 1958, and it, until Roundup, was the single biggest agrochemical used in the world. We use, still use about 80 million pounds annually in the United States. It's used in more than 80 countries, but it's now outlawed in all of Europe or denied regulatory approval, as the company likes to say, in the European Union. Now, with the industry's funding, we examine the effects of atrazine on development of the African clawed frog, a sort of standard laboratory amphibian model. And we showed, oh, 20 years ago, that atrazine inhibited growth of the voice box of the larynx in males, which would impair their ability to reproduce uh, because male frogs sing and females don't because males are trying to attract the females. And this larynx, the voice box, and the sound is controlled by androgens like testosterone, the same testosterone that we humans use. So this was potentially a, not a good finding for the company and certainly not a good finding um, given how much of this chemical is out in the environment. We examined the gonads of atrazine exposed frogs and showed that many of them, a significant number of them, developed as hermaphrodites with combinations of testes and ovaries, which is not typical, not normal in amphibian development. And then we hypothesize that although the testis should make testosterone, this hormone literally means the name, literally means testicular hormone, testosterone. We hypothesize that what atrazine does is it turns on an enzyme, the machinery, if you will, that converts testosterone into estrogen, the so-called female hormone. As a result, we propose that testosterone would go away. And for example, that's why the larynx or the voice box didn't grow but also the animals would be subsequently feminized. So if they're a genetic male making the female hormone estrogen, they would develop some female characteristics like ovaries, as, as, I, as I showed you earlier. So then we asked some questions about what happens when these animals become adults. So for example, we raised these animals up for four or five years until they became adults. And we found out that a significant proportion of them completely turn into females when they reach adulthood. So for example, what you're looking at on the top panel, I'm circling here, is females, genetic females, have a gene called DMW that males don't have. And males all have this gene called DMRT1. So this individual, for example, here is a genetic male and he's performing as a genetic male in their reproductive um, mating process. But also the animal that he's mating with is genetically a male, but she was capable of laying eggs and, and, and reproducing and we're now actually about to publish a paper on the great, great grandchildren of the eggs that you see here. So there were permanent um, endocrine disrupting effects of atrazine and consistent with the idea that it reduces androgen by causing it to be converted into estrogen. We asked other questions like whether or not these exposed males could reproduce. We showed that the males have reduced mating behavior. And even when they do copulate or mate, their fertility is much lower in atrazine-treated males compared to their control counterparts. And their fertility is lower because if you examine the testis, so here's a control on the left and atrazine treated on your right. In the controls, there's proper testosterone to maintain sperm development and, and sperm in the testis, as you can see here. But in the atrazine animals, in their testicular tubules, they have cellular debris. They don't have enough testosterone to show male mating behavior and they also don't have enough testosterone to keep sperm production viable. 
So are there effects in the wild? We've now we've published, but we've also have, have done a very large study, all the red dots here, all the way across the United States. And we have data now showing that this is not just a laboratory artifact, but animals that are exposed in the wild show similar demasculization and feminization effects than what we've shown in the laboratory. Now, is this a problem with just frogs? Because what I'd like to argue is that this little boy who likes frogs and my interest in frogs has taught me a lot about another aquatic organism, because we also start out in water and amniotic fluid. And the hormones that are important for my frogs are equally important in humans, testosterone, estrogen, thyroid hormones that are important in my frogs are made and used, those hormones, exactly the same way in humans. What's more is we now know that many of these chemicals cross the placenta and during development, mammals, including humans, can be exposed. We now know that you or your children in utero may be exposed to over 300 synthetic chemicals before they leave the womb. Now, so I would argue that a human fetus trapped in a contaminated amniotic fluid is no different than one of my tadpoles trapped in a contaminated pond or a contaminated aquarium in the laboratory. The good thing about atrazine is that we know what it does in development and in frogs. For most of these chemicals, we have no idea how they affect development and whether they're not their endocrine disruptors. The next questions that we started to ask, and now the, 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 this work that I'll tell you about is mostly not my work, not done in my laboratory, but we wondered, for example, I, I like to show this slide from Lake Nabugabo, Lake Nabugabo in Uganda, where the runoff from this crop is the same water that they use for drinking and cooking in, in this nearby village. And the idea is if the chemicals that they're placing in the environment can affect amphibians that are living in the water, how might it affect humans that are drinking that same water? Now, this connection between environmental health and public health is not restricted to places like Lake Nabugabo, Uganda. This is Oakland where I live and, and my water comes from here, from outside. I don't have to carry one of those yellow containers to get it. And we make these incorrect assumptions, however, that the companies would not allow chemicals to leak into the water that would impact us and that the environmental protectancy, if they did, would protect us further. I'm gonna tell you today that that's not quite the case. I published a paper with 22 co-authors from 12 different countries, and we showed that the problem is not just in frogs, testosterone is reduced in fish, in amphibians, and in rats. So rats are mammals like humans, so this is an effect that occurs commonly in the laboratory. What's more is we showed that if you look at my frogs again, testis, uh, sperm in the testis, expose them to atrazine, and there's no sperm or reduced sperm. The same thing has been shown in Belgium and fish that atrazine reduces sperm. The same thing has been shown in reptiles like alligators, um, sperm in the testis, give it atrazine and there's no sperm. This work was done in Argentina. This is in rats, sperm in the testicular tubules, give it atrazine, no sperm. This work was done both in Nigeria and in Croatia. And this work in Pakistan showed that birds, quail in this case, have sperm in the testicular tubules, expose them to atrazine and you can see now the testicles are empty, there's no sperm. What's more is we can't do experiments on humans, but Shauna Swan showed the following. She examined men in Columbia, Missouri and showed that men who had atrazine in their urine, 0.1 parts per billion, that's enough atrazine to chemically castrate a frog or a fish. Those men had low sperm count and couldn't get their wives pregnant. Now that's just a correlation, but gee, what an interesting coincidence that atrazine causes a reduction in sperm in every animal that's been studied. And it just so happens that atrazine is associated with a low sperm count in humans that are exposed to atrazine. What's more is other researchers have shown that if you get pregnant during peak atrazine contamination levels, as shown here in the filled graph, you're more likely to have a baby or babies with birth defects. If you're pregnant with a son, for example, you're more likely, and I apologize, there's some graphic images coming, but they say a picture is worth a thousand words. If you're pregnant with a son when you're and exposed to atrazine, you're more likely to have a baby with hypospadias. That's where the urethra doesn't end all the way through the penis. You're more likely to have a baby with protorchidism. That's when one or more of the testicles don't descend into the scrotum. And you're more likely to have a baby with micropenis. That's where the penis doesn't actually grow. And what's interesting to me is that this is just a correlation, but we know that male genital development depends on testosterone and that these malformations can be induced by estrogen. And if you're exposed, if you're a male child and you're exposed in utero to a chemical that reduces 
testosterone and increases estrogen, you have a baby that looks like it hasn't had enough testosterone or it's been exposed to too much estrogen. What's more is that's just a correlation, but here's a researcher who showed the same thing experimentally in mice, that atrazine causes a reduction in penis size and it causes hypospadias, that atrazine in the laboratory causes cryptorchidism. So here are the two testicles in the scrotum exposed to atrazine. One of the testicles is still inside the body and hasn't descended. And it shows that atrazine significantly reduces testosterone. So even though these data in humans are just correlations, experimentally, the exact same effects have been shown with atrazine, a chemical that's consistent with the demasculinizing and feminizing effects of atrazine. I'm gonna tell you about one last series of studies. These were all done by the Environmental Protection Agency who showed that if you expose a mouse, a rat to atrazine, it's more likely to have an abortion because of the hormonal problems that atrazine causes. Of those rats that don't abort, another EPA laboratory showed that the sons are born with prostate disease. The male pups are born with a prostate that looks like that of an old man. And the daughters are born with impaired mammary or breast development, as shown here, such that when they grow up, their offspring suffer from retarded growth and development. And this study struck me because one, I study frogs because I'm a little boy who likes frogs. I guarantee you people who study rats don't do so because they're little boys and girls who like rats. They study rats because it, they, rats are like mammals, like us, and they tell us something about our own uh, development and health. And what this study is telling us that is that this rat was never exposed to atrazine in the study. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. And so if that study was done to tell us something about humans, it makes me realize that I have a much bigger responsibility than just a little boy who likes frogs. This study is telling us that our grandchildren, that your grandchildren could be affected by chemicals that we're using today. And that study alone, not mine, that study alone made me realize that I have a much bigger responsibility, social responsibility than just a little boy who likes frogs. All of these effects that I've shown you with atrazine and more, as I said, atrazine is primarily used on corn. Here's a graph of where all the corn goes, our number one crop in the United States. What's missing from this graph is food. We eat so little of the corn directly as humans that it doesn't even show up in the figure, yet we're taking all of these risks for environmental health and public health for a chemical that increases corn yield by 1.2%. As a result of speaking out about the dangers of atrazine and, and, and using my science in this way, oftentimes I do give talks or headlines like this, controversy surrounds, in this case, the University of Oregon speaker. And that controversy comes because I've often pointed out that the company has gone through great lengths to try to discredit me. They responded to New Yorker Magazine, Syngenta in 2014. The spokesperson said, I am troubled by a suggestion that we have ever tried to discredit anyone. Our focus has always been on communicating the science and setting the record straight. So they denied that they ever tried to discredit me and keep this information from the public. When in fact, in court, a court case, which didn't involve me, but documents were turned in that revealed their strategy for science on atrazine. And here's their number one goal in their own handwriting, discredit Hayes, not to make the data and information available to the public who are being exposed to this chemical, their number one goal under the science was discredit haze. And now when we turn to the EPA, what does the EPA say about atrazine? They acknowledge that the company withholds information. They said here, it is unfortunate but not uncommon for registrants to sit on data that may be considered adverse to the public's perception of their products. Science can be manipulated to serve certain agendas. All you can do is practice suspended disbelief. What's more is in 2020, finally after 20 years of reviewing my work and others, the EPA released a draft biological ev evaluation for atrazine and, and related compounds. And they concluded that atrazine is likely to adversely affect 54% of all species and 40% of critical habitats. This is the Environmental Protection Agency. So what do they do? I wanna point out that they issued this report in September, 2020. Also in September 20, the EPA reapproves atrazine. So they had the information that it impacted wildlife and habitats, yet we're still using atrazine. 
And the reason being, as the EPA said to New Yorker Magazine in 2014, quote, a monetary value is assigned to disease, impairments, and shortened lives and weighed against the benefits of keeping a chemical in use. So they know that it causes negative impacts on the environment, but somebody makes money on it. It's because of this that I've done away with, I was taught by my graduate advisor, don't be an advocate. He said, let the science speak for itself. I've decided to speak out for the science because oftentimes, as you can see, the science doesn't speak for, its, for itself. And I've taken that upon myself. In fact, I'm gonna to end today with two quotes that now reflect my philosophy about my role as a scientist and a citizen. One of those says, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. So you, not only can you be a scientist and an advocate, this guy says that you have a duty to do both. And finally, I wanna end with another quote. It's time for us as a people to start making some changes. Let's change the way we eat. Let's change the way we live. Let's change the way we treat each other. You see, the old way wasn't working. So it's on us to do what we gotta do to survive. And this great thing can set that. Thank you. Let's welcome Bertha Lewis, president, the Black Institute, New York City. Hello, everybody. My name is Bertha Lewis and I am the president and founder of the Black Institute. And I'm here today because I want to talk to you about Poison Parks, environmental racism in New York City in 2021. Now, for some of you, you might not know the Black Institute, who is that? The Black Institute is an action tank. That is a think tank that takes action. I founded the Black Institute after running ACORN in 2010. What we do is we have a head, a heart, and a feet strategy. The head being knowledge, research, data, but we bring that knowledge down to the heart and we make it plain and we develop public policy, legislation, and we do training but the head and the heart can't function without the feet. And so we also do community organizing for the issues that we care about. We have four big issues, education, the environment, uh, immigration, and economics. And we did a report in uh, 2020 called Poison Park. That was environmental racism in New York City parks. And this was part of our environmental bucket. So what does that mean, poison parks? What we found going all the way back <clears throat> when I first learned about this in 2013, 2014, there was this thing called glyphosate. What is a glyphosate? My God. And this, and this thing, it sounds like uh, one of those like Japanese like monsters or something. Ah, glyphosate. Um, but this chemical is in our parts. And you might know this by the popular name. You've seen the commercials. Roundup. Just spray it on your lawns and you can get rid of those weeds. And this thing is produced by a gigantic mega corporation called Monsanto. And those of you in the environmental community, you know Monsanto, bad, bad, bad. However, they've been gobbled up by another mega corporation, Bayer, you know Bayer, the ones that make the aspirins to get rid of your headache that is probably caused by Roundup from Monsanto. I found out in 2013, 2014, uh, while I was organizing around public housing 
and where lo low and moderate income folks lived, poor people and people of color, the parks around public housing, the parks department would come out and spray. So I'm like, what are you spraying? Oh, it's just an herbicide, don't worry about it. And a friend of mine named Reverend Billy Talon and his Stop Shopping Choir, they had been fighting against Monsanto for years. And Reverend Billy called me and he said, that is the monster glyphosate. It is poison, it is carcinogenic, and it has been linked to one disease after another, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. You got kidney damage, birth defects, chromosomal, or not, and, uh, chromosomal abnormalities. You've got all kinds of horrible things that it has done in rodents and you've got all kinds of horrible consequences with all manner of mammals in their reproduction. So you can imagine, what would it do to a human being? There was a man named Dwayne Lee Johnson. This man was a, a worker, gardener. He didn't know he was spraying Roundup the monster glyphosate. And in 2019, he went to court and he won for the first time ever because of his severe reaction to this. He proved in court that his cancer was caused by spraying Roundup uh, in all of the years that he had been working as a maintenance worker. So we know that it is harmful. We know that it is. And here's the thing. When you go to your park and you lay your blanket down and maybe you're there with your significant other and you start to smooch and cuddle and kind of just sort of like, just waddle around and just roll in the grass. Stop it, it's nasty. It is poisoning you. Now, why is this important? Because poor people, even middle-class people use our public parks. They not, might not be able to have a summer home in the Hamptons or you know, in the Bahamas or somewhere. And so you go with your family, you do picnics, barbecues, you walk your pets, you lay your blanket down, you let your babies crawl around on this. And all the time, your municipality, not just in New York City, is poisoning you. We did a FOIL request, that's a Freedom of Information Act request. And I guess I shouldn't have been surprised, but I was. Communities of color were being exposed to the type of glyphosate and spraying of this herbicide poison disproportionately than white neighborhoods. For example, there's a park called Roy Wilkins Park out in Queens. They had 100% of concentrate. They didn't even try to water it down, sprayed in this park. This is where middle-class, mostly African-Americans go. And they go there in the springtime, in the summer, in the fall. And guess what? If you spray it in one place, it moves. You know, water, the air is going to carry it everywhere. Now, in New York City Central Park, <laughs> let me just say, a whole lot of white people live right around that park. They only had a two to 3% concentration. 
Of the 50 parks and playgrounds in 2018, you know what we find out of the 50? 42 located in Harlem were sprayed the most and those neighborhoods were 62% African-American. This is the spraying of racial herbicide that is poisoning us. This is racial environmental, like extinction. And this has been going on for years. Tens of thousands of black and brown New Yorkers are just unwittingly, unknowingly exposed to this. City workers, city workers that are mostly black and brown. 77% of all city parks workers are black and brown folks exposed to this. But, <laughs> It's not just that they're spraying it. When they try to dispose of the, of the herbicides and all of the other chemicals and pesticides that they use, guess what they do? They truck that waste, guess through whose neighborhoods? Again, you're getting a double and a triple dose, but they don't go through wealthier and whiter neighborhoods. I mean, that means that low and moderate income neighborhoods and black and brown folks, they are affected more than anyone. If this isn't environmental racism, I don't know what is. But let me just remind everyone, we're in the middle of a pandemic. You know, miss Corona, COVID-19, and guess what? If you have an underlying condition like asthma, okay, respiratory issue, um, any of the underlying conditions that round up the glyphosate monster causes, you are more subjected to getting COVID-19. So it is any wonder why black and brown minorities all across this country are more susceptible and are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. But there's hope, there's a bright light. So what do you do, you know, when they poison you? You stand up and you fight back. And so we put together a coalition, we wrote legislation and we did uh, in our city council, because we wanted to get this out of our city parks, we introduced resolution 1524. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? On Earth Day, April 22nd, Earth Day, it passed the city council unanimously, banning all glyphosate banning all pesticides in public parks, New York City parks, playgrounds, and playing fields. Now, we got 99.9% .9 of what we wanted because the parks department is still trying to spray this stuff along uh, highways. But you know what? <laughs> we beat them once and we can beat them again. And so all uh, the purpose of this talk is please everyone, this is going on across America. In your town, find out what's being sprayed in your parks, stand up, speak up, stop letting them poison you. We gotta stop these gigantic corporations like Monsanto and Bayer. It's springtime people. Summer is coming as a takeoff from Game of Thrones. Let's make sure that our parks are poison three. Thank you all. And if you need me, I'm there to help you fight. I'm Bertha Lewis at B Lewis at the Black Institute.org.
Give me a call. I'll send you our Poison Parks report. Call me at 212-871-6899. We can beat Monsanto and we can get rid of Roundup. Thank you all. Let's welcome Dr. Leo Trasante, professor in the Departments of Pediatrics and Environmental Medicine, Grossman School of Medicine, New York University, New York City. So my life's work is focused in particular on what synthetic chemicals in the environment do to all of us, especially children. Um, and we probably haven't heard much about endocrine disruptors until recently. Let me boil down some basic terminology first and foremost. So endocrine refers to signaling molecules, natural molecules that we use for every basic biological function known to humankind, maintaining healthy body temperature, metabolism, salt, sugar, even sex. And when we're talking about endocrine disruption, we're talking about synthetic molecules, uh, not natural molecules that scramble those natural molecular signals and thereby contribute to disease and disability across the lifespan. We know of about a thousand synthetic chemicals that hack our molecular signals and thereby contribute to disease and disability. Uh, the evidence is strongest for five categories of, of chemicals. And I'm gonna focus my comments the rest of the way on pesticides, which are used in agriculture, but it's important to emphasize there are other chemicals that do the same kinds of damage to human health. So we're talking about bisphenols used in aluminum can linings, thermal paper receipts, brominated flame retardants used in electronics and furniture. We're talking about phthalates used in personal care products, cosmetics, and food packaging. And the most recent category of chemicals on the scene are the perfluorophyll substances, the forever chemicals that were profiled in the movie called Dark Waters, in which Mark Ruffalo starred. Those are used in nonstick cooking and oil and water resistant clothing. So you might ask, well, why do we only know about those five categories? The fact is that not all chemicals are required to be tested for their effects on hormonal function. And our understanding of what makes hormones go amok has changed too. We know that genes and their expression are affected by these chemicals in a way that is separate from how a chemical, let's say, fits into a receptor in the human body or in a, in a cell that ultimately communicates changes. So uh, it's no longer whether a chemical looks like a hormone, it's about what a chemical does to hormonal function and that readout. Now, when it comes to pesticides, we know the most about one particular category of pesticides, the organophosphorus pesticides, and we know about them because they are known to disrupt thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone is a crucial growth factor for a baby's brain development. Um, and in multiple studies from across the world, we've seen consistent relationships between the exposure of pesticides uh, in a mother's urine, typically, and even sometimes in a baby's cord blood have been related to decreases in cognitive potential. Uh, the reason that that happens is that thyroid hormone is a crucial growth factor and mom provides most of the baby's thyroid hormone for practically the first two trimesters of a pregnancy. And so if you scramble that thyroid hormone in the middle of pregnancy, even in the clinically normal range, you can have negative effects such as decreases in IQ, even autism and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And so we have studies that have documented not just that pesticides wreck thyroid hormone metabolism, they, they affect how the thyroid hormone directly binds. And as a result, we've seen these readouts in the form of decreases in IQ in kids. Uh, we also have seen um, not just psychological measures like IQ or cognitive function be affected, we've seen brain images where kids who are highly exposed to pesticides in utero uh, have smaller parts of their frontal and parietal cortex. These are parts of the brain that are crucial for those higher order functions that make children be well able to produce in school, 
or contribute to our economy. And ultimately, we're, when we're talking about the use of pesticides, we're talking about agricultural production and economic activity. Um, and we typically think about that in a one-sided kind of way. We think about how much money we're earning by making certain crops. And the cost of the pesticide is relatively small as a percentage of the whole. But there are other consequences to these pesticides as they're used in the environment uh, that aren't considered fully in the transaction, the, the agricultural sale and, and production process. So Adam Smith, the father of modern economics, would actually be an environmental advocate because he would see this as a disruption of normal market function because pesticides create externalities. They have adverse consequences for people who don't even buy or sell the corn or the wheat or whatever's being produced on the market. They're third parties that suffer the consequences. And so the corn and wheat and the use of the pesticides are priced lower than the societally optimal price. And there's too much produced compared to the optimal amount. So none of what I'm saying here tonight suggests that there everything should be zeroed out and we should go back to the 1500s here. The reality is that we have uh, toxic exposures that get in the way of our economic potential. We know in Europe that the cost of organophosphate pesticides on the cognitive potential is 121 billion euro alone. That's nearly 1% of its gross domestic product. And the reason for that is if a child comes back with one less IQ point, maybe mom doesn't notice, the teacher doesn't notice, the pediatrician might not notice. But if 100,000 people lose one IQ point, the entire economy notices because each IQ point is roughly worth 2% of a child's economic productivity. And if they make roughly a million dollars over his or her lifetime, 2% of a million dollars is a big number, $20,000. Then you add that up across 4 million kids born in the US or in Europe each year, and you have a lot of zeros on the right side of that number, and that's a big economic impact. Now in the US, we're actually a, a good example of when policy works because policies reduce or increase exposure. Exposure contributes to disease, and disease ultimately costs our economy. In the US, you heard that number of 121 billion euro in Europe. The cost is lower, $47 billion. You would think, well, wow, we haven't actually banned organophosphorus pesticides in agriculture. And that's true. It should be a lot closer to zero. But we actually made a lot of progress back in the 1990s through a law called the Federal Food Quality Protection Act, or FQPA. And that required additional safety factors be put in place for kids. And so that actually reduced the level of pesticide below uh, what would be allowable in food. So it reduced the exposure to the most toxic pesticides that we're talking about here today. So that's a shining example of when policy works that protects kids and all of us, frankly, because we know pesticides have other consequences. They've increasingly been linked to cancer, for example, uh, as, a, as a, an effect on adults, actually. Uh, kids often tell us the first alarm, or they sound the first alarm for the consequences on all of us ultimately. So that's not to say we know everything about the toxic effects of pesticides. That's not to say there aren't other consequences and there aren't other effects of other pesticides. What I can tell you is that they're safe and simple steps to reduce these exposures. And we've already talked about the huge benefit of public policy in driving the change we seek. So we know that eating organic can reduce pesticide levels, not just in high income populations, but in low income populations as well. We know that that's important and that's, you know, that's that there are things like food deserts and there are food options and we are concerned about uh, low resource populations getting uh, the right and healthiest foods. But um, when it comes to organic food, it's a bit of a misnomer that organic food is simply something for the well-to-do. We know that as organic 
food has come on the scene and increasing attention and market share. That has actually driven prices down such that in the big box stores, you're seeing a, an almost equivalent comparable price profile. So I work at Bellevue Hospital, the flagship of, of the public hospital system in, in New York City. And what I can tell you is I used to not advise fam families to focus on eating organic as a safe and simple step to reduce exposure. But we know that it's accessible now so that the price point is not the driver. And it's particularly the leafy greens and vegetables where it's most important to eat organic because those are where the pesticides will reside and ultimately enter the human body and the bloodstream most quickly and, and exped expeditiously. So we know that this doesn't have to be something for the well to do. And when it comes to other safe and simple steps we can all take, it doesn't require a PhD in chemistry either. Um, we know again that you can reduce phthalate exposures uh, by reading the label in low-income populations of certain personal care products. We know that avoiding canned food consumption is a straightforward way to reduce your bisphenol exposure. These are all safe and simple steps that we can take to reduce these exposures. Um, now, we need to continue to push on the public policy front to reduce these exposures in the first place. And we know these exposures come from spraying on lawns, in homes, and on food, ultimately through, through agriculture. And we need multiple steps taken. There are many gaps in our knowledge about pesticides and herbicides and their effect on human health. And in particular, I'll just close with a comment about risk and often how that's misrepresented to essentially push aside concerns about the safety of uh, certain pesticides and herbicides used. We have often gotten lulled into the notion that we can measure an exposure and extrapolate from high level exposures down to low level exposures. But organophosphorus pesticides, brominated flame retardants, even metals like lead and mercury have taught us that the human body doesn't follow a straight line logic that our brains are wrapping our heads around. Um, there are super linear, so steeper than straight line relationships at low level exposures. So particularly little things do matter. We also know that chemicals can follow uh, roller coaster rides with respect to effects. So what you might think is uh, safe at a high level of exposure means that there's no level of exposure below which there's effect. You don't understand where you are on that roller coaster ride. It could actually be that you're, you are at a low point. And you're actually going to go back to a higher point where you have effects. And there are biological mechanisms that are consistent and explain this unusual relationship that the human body, human brain has difficulty wrapping its head around. So the main message here is that we do need to adapt our mindset from thinking about risk to thinking about hazards in our environment. It's not really the dose that is the only thing that makes the poison. The reality is there are other chemical exposures, there are genetic susceptibilities, there are age-related susceptibilities that all inform how we think about uh, pesticide and herbicide safety from a human health perspective. And in particular, we have seen Europe take substantial leadership in taking on this notion that we don't really need to consider exposure, that we need to find chemicals when they're toxic and get rid of them regardless about the level of the exposure, because we often can't figure out the effects of lower level exposures from these higher level toxicology experiments. We're using antiquated tools still to assess effects on human health and often things just don't translate. Um, so people ask me all the time, am I hopeful? Like I would be depressed if I had to do the work you do. And I, I see it quite the opposite. I've seen so much change, uh, be it through consumer activism as well as policy prevention. We've seen substantial drop-offs in levels of certain pesticides and herbicides in detectable in people over time. So it's actually made our work as researchers harder. That's a challenge I like to take on each day. And that's what gives me a lot of hope is that we've made so much progress. 
So I'm um, sorry that I we can't be together in person for this conference, but I'm excited about the prospects and look forward to further conversations. Thank you.